A historian of religion and author, Elaine Pagels is here with us this evening to delve into her complex approach to religion and her own faith. While her traditional Christian beliefs have since evolved, Dr. Pagels' early convision, conversion at a Billy Graham event a Billy Graham crusade has ultimately inspired her deep, her deep academic interest in religion and its history and given us such acclaimed works as her 1979 bestseller, The Gnostic, the Gnostic Gospels. Dr. Pagels is here tonight to explore a question that has been asked by a multitude of non-religious folks, skeptics, and academics alike. How has religion remained such a strong force in today's cultural climate? This is the question Ms. Dr. Pagels addresses in her newest work, her memoir, Why Religion? A deeply personal exploration of her own history, why religion examines how her experiences have influenced her life and scholarship. She draws upon the work of neurologists, anthropologists, and other historians in addition to her own research to give us an idea of why religion has persevered and remained a central aspect of many cultures today. Dr. Pagels will be in conversation with Dr. Eric Motley, an executive vice president at the Aspen Institute with a very long and intimidating CV. <laughs> <laughs> Before oh, yes. his career at the Aspen Institute, he was the director of the U.S. Department of State's Office of International Visitors in the Bureau of Public Diplomacy. Prior to that, he was special assistant to President George W. Bush for presidential personnel in 2003. Last year, Dr. Motley authored a memoir called Madison Park, A Place of Hope, which tells the story of the small town in Alabama he grew up in, which was founded by freed <coughs> slaves in 1880. So without further delay, please help me welcome Dr. Elaine Pagels and Dr. Eric Motley. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Thank you. You know, a Is couple of yeah, it's, it's working. Yes, I think okay. it's working. A couple of Sundays ago, the Bishop of Washington, Bishop Buddy, who's here, gave a sermon, and in her sermon, she spoke about this wonderful new book. And I feel like Elaine, the entire cathedral, has returned here tonight. <laughs> I'm honored. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for coming. But what a beautiful book you've written. And I don't want to refer to it as a memoir. I actually think it's about man's search for meaning, about redemption. It's really a meditation on life and how one understands one's own journey and makes sense of one's journey in life. A couple of years ago, I had the great fortunate pleasure of being at the White House with you when President Obama presented you the Medal for Humanities. And this is what the citation read. For her exploration of faith and its traditions, through her study of ancient manuscripts and other scholarly work, she has generated new interest in dialogue about our contemporary search for knowledge and meaning. And I thought, wow, it can't get any better than this, Elaine. Being in the White House with that, President Obama. That was a wonderful, <laughs> memorable event. I always think of yeah. you there, too. And you know, as he was chronicling your entire professional life, I started to think when this book came out, what more is there to say? You have given us the Gnostic Gospels. You've introduced Thomas to us anew. You've even touched Satan in a very interesting way. Oh, yeah. Satan yeah. touches everybody. Yeah, he does. <laughs> <laughs> and so after 30 years in the academy as a historian of religion, totally committed to scholarship, why this book and why now? That's a good question, Eric. Um, I don't think of it as a memoir either. I, it was a book I never thought I would write. Um, because it's so personal. It's not like the histories I've read. Is this loud enough? It's, um, it's so different from anything I've ever written. It's like a different voice. But now that my children were out of the house, I had a little more time. Um, things that I had put in the background, had to put in the background because they were so painful. Um, I had to allow them to emerge and experience them uh, in a way that I I was too shocked to do so at the time. That's part of it. So that's a kind of therapeutic aspect. But also it's about what you said. It's about the way the way that that uh, my work and my life are are deeply intertwined. I didn't want to write just a personal story. It's a story about the it's about the yoga of the work that I do um, as well as as the explorations that, that I started with uh, even when I was about 15. I want to start at the very beginning. Tell us about your family. Where did you grow up? Tell us about your father in particular and his influence on you. Well, I grew up in what I said was the, the most boring town in the world. That's how it looked 
to me anyway. Um, it was in California, Palo Alto. Nothing but sort of <laughs> suburban lawns, very homogenous, you know. It was like growing up inside of a giant marshmallow, is what one of my friends said. <laughs> with all the edges kind of muffled, you know, suburban. And uh, my father, my family was culturally Protestant, but, but my father had given up the kind of ferocious Calvinism of his, of his family uh, for Darwin. And he basically said, well, and, you know, religion is just a bunch of old folk tales, and we don't need that, and educated people don't need that. Only people who aren't would ever bother with the, the Bible and all that stuff. So I was brought up, I loved poetry and music yeah. and dance, and, you know, and I didn't think much about religion. But then at age 15... <laughs> a group of friends share with you this interesting proposition. You all got in a car. Oh, my God. Billy Graham was not the person that I would have expected <laughs> to bring Elaine Pagels to faith. Well, he didn't. Okay. Uh, didn't he, no, I mean, I'm saying, I, did, okay. I thought you were going to say to San Francisco. Uh, <laughs> no, I wouldn't have. I or didn't, Billy Graham in San Francisco I is up, a wonder man. I didn't go up to hear Billy Graham. I went because they said they were going to San Francisco. And I thought, hey, any day in San Francisco is better than Palo Alto. <laughs> so, so I went. And I didn't know what, what I was getting into. But this was Candlestick Park. You know, right. where I'd seen mm -hmm. baseball, and it was packed with 18,000 people and 6,000 people in the parking lot. Um, and it was Billy Graham, you know, he was, yeah. he was about 30 then. He was very charismatic, maybe 35, um, speaking, and he surprised me by things he said. What did he say? Well, you know, I was brought up in a family that was... Um, patriotic. They were second generation immigrants, my mother's family from Holland and my father's family from Switzerland. So America was the best country in the world and it was the standard of morality. And, and uh, you know, it was it was perfect. And and science was the, the, the source of all wisdom. So Billy Cram was saying, this is going to sound weird to you intellectuals. And it really did. He said he, he, he condemned America for having, for, for encouraging its sons, and of course not its daughters, to, to become scientists to build bigger weapons. And this is after American bombs had killed 100,000 people in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And I had never thought of that, you know? How, how had I not thought of that? Um, he talked about how segregation and slavery had been... Um, validated on the basis of the Bible. I was stunned. I mean, I just hadn't thought about what he called the sins of America, and I thought it was very powerful. And then he went on and said, well, but you can be born again. You can have a new family. You can break out of your life. You can start all over in a much bigger universe. And, you know, that was just irresistible. I was just turning 15. And, you know, what, what better could you imagine? So this huge choir is singing. It was very emotional. It was very powerful. And I just went with it. I just went down and I got born again and saved. It was great. <laughs> until, until I got home. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about home. What did your father say? <laughs> I don't remember what he said, but I remember how angry he was and, and how horrified. Um, I mean, there's some things you can do to rebel, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't thinking of it that way. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, my parents were really shocked. But there was something about the power of that experience and the imagination. And, the, you know, it was, it was mm. quite deep. So I joined an evangelical group in Palo Alto for about a year. I thought it was like falling in love when right. you're 14 or 15, yeah. you know. A year is a pretty long yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then I fell out of love yeah. with it. I, I want to talk a bit about your falling out of love. You had a friend. His name was Paul. He was in a car accident. Tell us a bit about Paul and not just about the accident, but the response of other Christian friends and how that kind of well, that's, jarred you. Well, that's what just got me out of that group. Um, yeah, my friend was 16. He, we were, you know, about yeah. that age in high school. And uh, he was in a car accident. The car was, you know, 100 miles an hour. They were racing. Um, and he was killed instantly. And 
I was devastated. Uh, suddenly, to see somebody that alive and that vivid and that remarkable just gone like that. Um, and I went back to the evangelical church, and I, I told them, and they said, oh, terrible. The, uh, was he born again? And I said, uh, no, he was Jewish. And they said, well, then he's in hell. And I was really shocked, because I thought, that has nothing to do with what, with what brought me there. Nothing. And and I, I just was stunned, and I I walked out of the church, and I never went back. I want to take a detour, Elaine. This book is so richly sown with wonderful narratives and insights, and I know there are questions that you want to ask, but I got to ask you, Jerry Garcia. Yes. I mean, I, I stopped for a moment, and I thought, maybe Jerry Garcia is a theologian that I, I'm confusing for the Grateful Dead. But his name just struck me on the page. What is your relationship with Jerry Garcia? Was he a part of this group of friends that knew Paul? He was. Um, he was older than the rest of us. He was, yeah. I don't know, in his mid-20s. We were high school kids. But I was hanging around Palo Alto with a group of renegades. And artists, musicians, and, and Jerry Garcia had just come out of the army. Right. He was this Hispanic guy with nine and a half fingers and a 12-string guitar. <laughs> And he could play it amazingly. And, you know, so we were in a group together and we just spent time together. Um, not a lot, but it was it was great. He was in that accident uh, when Paul was killed and he was actually thrown out through the front windshield and he said his shoes were torn off, uh, very badly injured. And his, uh, his our friend Alan Trist was in it and Alan became the business manager for the Grateful Dead. Mm. And and later, um, when I, uh, the band hadn't started, you know, that was years before. And when I finally came back to Palo Alto after I was in graduate school, or to San Francisco, they had this group, and I thought the name would have to come from that accident, and it did. Uh, because Jerry later wrote, I didn't know, but I, I, I knew that it must have, um, he wrote that his he had to take his life seriously because he almost didn't make it. Um, I just got a letter this week from Alan Trist. I was so happy. Wow. I hadn't heard from him for a long, long wow. time, wow. talking about those times and saying, we've got to get together and talk. Wow. So wow. we have a few things to talk I about. I think you do. <laughs> yes. He should read the book first. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send it to okay. him. Yeah. You know... Throughout the book, this one question, this looming question is, in this highly scientific age in which we live in today, why does religion still matter? Why does it continue? And what meaning are we trying to draw from it, Elaine? Well, that's such a big question, you know. I was asking myself that because, you know, I was brought up to think, well, it's just going to die out, you know, a sort of peaceful death. And, and it hasn't happened. I, and I was deeply moved by it. I mean, I left that evangelical church and I didn't go back. Um, but about four or five years later, I was thinking, what, what was it about that? Was it religion? Was it Christianity? Could it be any religion? I don't know. And uh, how did the movement, I mean, who is Jesus anyway? Do we know? Uh, what do we know? How did how did Jesus's life turn into uh, the Roman Catholic Church in the fourth century, and and today just an enormous range of of institutions and groups claiming his. How did that happen? So I I decided I'd try to find out, and I went to graduate school to a secular school because I didn't want to be brainwashed. And um, is this is Harvard. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and. <laughs> And I was, the best thing about it was, first of all, I found out you couldn't, there's, we don't know a lot about Jesus. I mean, there are a lot of books written, but there's a limit to what we know because he was pretty obscure in his own time, um, except for his intensely committed followers. But, but my f professors had these file cabinets full of secret gospels. I'd never heard of the Gospel of Thomas or the Gospel of Philip or the Gospel of Mary Magdalene or the Gospel of uh, Judas. I mean, 
all these other 51 sacred texts, some of them Jewish, some of them Egyptian, Greek, and many of them Christian, from the from the first and second century of the Christian era. And we never knew this stuff because it was all burned, banned, and buried by the bishops in the fourth century. And so all of it had been destroyed, all the original copies in Greek of these texts. And we now had copies in Coptic, which was the Egyptian right. language into which right. they were translated by monks who loved these texts, mm -hmm. Christian monks. So that was the fun of it. We had a great discovery of realizing that Christianity is much wider and deeper and more complex and more multiform than it is even today. Because today, Christian groups agree on pretty much the same Gospels and, and, and similar views about Jesus and similar kinds of organization. But then it was all wide open. Mm -hmm. And it's just amazing to look at that material. Mm -hmm. Why is it still today? Well, I, I've been asking myself, why do I care about it now? Um, there are lots of reasons. I mean, there's so many ways to answer that, that I can't be co comprehensive, you know? You could talk psychologically or anthropologically or... Philosophically or theologically. Lots yeah. of other yeah. ways, yeah. yeah. And, uh, yeah, you did philosophy. Yeah. <laughs> it's not my thing. Yeah. And, and so... Um, I realize that, you know, f first of all, there are ways that that those ancient stories speak to meaning. They speak to what happens to people and how people have coped with it and survived for thousands and thousands of years. They've been sustaining, you know, like the book of Job, for example, uh, the New Testament Gospels, some of the Psalms. Uh, this is part of a cultural legacy that even if you're not steeped in it, as some people here no doubt are, you still, it's part of the cultural air you breathe, you know, in this part of the world. And so um, that's one thing. And it's it's the way that the culture has shaped our attitudes about everything from what it means to be human to sexual attitudes to political attitudes, attitudes about humans and nature. <clears throat> it's all there in Genesis. And and even if you don't believe any of it, I mean, I wrote about Adam and Eve. I mean, how many people here are thinking a lot about Adam and Eve? It's just that that story still articulates values. You know, it's when I went to study, you know, when I, when I read about African Right, yeah. creation stories, I realize these stories tell you about the values of the culture and they influence the culture, whether you're part of Christian culture or not. Um, I wrote about Satan because uh, some of the effects of the, of the kinds of stories that are told about Satan are still alive and well. Um, some of them much for the worse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's part of the culture and I think we I need to understand yeah. that. That's that's yeah. another side of it. Yeah. yeah, we could go all day on that. Yeah. You know, I've oh. always wanted to ask you. I didn't know your husband. He was a theoretical physicist of extraordinary note, and I wondered how the two of you sat at home at night making sense <laughs> of this complex universe. You know, well, that's you not all we did. Living in ancient texts. <laughs> <laughs> and and his more empirical and scientific way of looking at things. What did, what did Hans make of all of this? Well, he thought what I studied was pretty strange yeah. um, at first. And he said, you know, what, what were you studying religion? I mean, why don't you think about something that has a real impact in the world? <laughs> I said, why, why, do you, why are you looking at elementary particles? You know, I mean, do we really care if the floor is made up of molecules? Um, so, so yeah. we, we, what, what we realized is, is that science and religion or not, as my father assumed, and many people did in that generation in conflict with each other. These are very different, um, fields of discourse right. and they address very different questions. They absolutely don't cancel each other out by any means. Uh, and there are plenty of questions left in both of them. Mm -hmm. So so we 
we enjoyed that, actually. He suggested we write a book. He wrote a book called The Cosmic Code. Right, yes. And he suggested we write one called The Gnostic Code or The Cosmic Gospels. <laughs> but we, ne- we didn't get to do it, sadly. So much of the book, not all the book, is about suffering, about incidents in your life that occurred where you had to draw on the strength of verse and poetry and the other mediums of intellect and and humanity. You two had a child. The child was born with a heart defect. Just tell us a bit about the child and how you and your husband dealt with the journey of dealing with this bad news. Yeah, he was a marvelous child. Um, And, you know, we had wanted a child for a long time. And we had a child who was very much like Heinz, actually, um, and just marvelous. But he was born with a heart defect, and that was surgically repaired very well. And two, when he was two, mm. we were about to go to Colorado, and they did a cardiac catheterization, and the doctors came back after nine hours and said, we can't believe it, but he has pulmonary hypertension. And all the only words I remember from that meeting were invariably fatal. Right. At which, yeah, you know, there it was. And uh, so I finally said, "Well, how, how how much time?" And they said, "A couple months, a couple years, something like that." So we were living with that, and uh, you were living with it, but you never exposed him. To that awareness, is that correct? Not yeah. we. We didn't talk yeah. to Mark about yeah. it because he had a huge scar in his chest, yeah. you know, from open heart surgery. So, um, you know, if he'd asked questions about his life expectancy, we would have talked to him about it, but he didn't. Yeah. Um, but he was very much aware of it somehow. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so that was that was really a heartbreak, and it was very hard to deal with. Uh, we had each other, we had friends, um, we somehow got through it. And then about a year and a half later, you lost your husband in a very tragic, um, hiking accident in Aspen. And so you had to yet again, draw on that inner strength. How, where did you find that strength, Elaine? Well, I didn't find it then. I was just totally devastated. I don't think I had any inner strength at that point because he was such a wonderful person and, uh, you know, we really were very happy yeah. for 22 years. So, I don't know, I floundered as much as I could at that point. And uh, we had, we had after our son's death, uh, I felt that we, you know, what do you do? I went to a psychiatrist who was recommended by... Uh, my children's godfather, who's a psychiatrist in New York. And he said, why don't you regard your students as your children? And I thought, I'm not that crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that, that doesn't work. <laughs> so I figured that, you know, I didn't want to be, you know, when, when your child is going to high school and college and getting married, I didn't want to think that, our only son had died when he was six. So we adopted two children. I mean, I felt that Mark was requiring us because we loved him so much, because we missed him so much, that he just made us go out and scrounge for any babies we could get uh, with an adoption agency in Texas. Um, And so we adopted two children. And at the time of his death, our son David was three months old and Sarah was one and a half. So I was really devastated. Um, yeah, I just sort of yeah. scraped by the best that I could for a while. Yeah. Yeah. How did the Gnostic Gospels, how did your, your study of ancient texts come to inform your own understanding of suffering and your own understanding of how to make sense out of all of this? Well, making sense is something I yeah. didn't aspire to. It was more yeah. like survival. But but I, I did feel that the Gospel of Thomas had spoken to something very deeply because it talks about um, how all 
people are created in the image of God. It talked about the connections between all human beings right. and their source, the divine source. And it teaches that you can find your way back to the divine source because you have access to that within yourself, whether you know it or not. And that's why the bishops didn't like these texts, because they suggested you could get to the divine source, whatever that, it, however you see that, without a church, without a bishop, without Jesus, for that matter, because you had access mm -hmm. just deep within. Mm -hmm. And I did feel that that I had in those, in what was given in those sources, a sort of sense of a path. You know, where the Gospel right. of Thomas says, if you bring forth what is within you, what you bring forth will save you. If you do not bring forth what is within you, what you do not bring forth will destroy you. And I didn't know if I could survive what happened. I didn't really want to for some time. But I needed to for those children mm. and for my husband because he wouldn't have left them. So they suggested a way, you know. And, uh, and later I went to the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, um, had to leave New York because I couldn't live there, you know, right. and have the children in New York. So, and I started to write and think about my work again, which, which became another path, along with friendship. That was very important. There are so many questions that I want to ask you. I'll give the audience the opportunity, but I want to ask you just two more People who know that I know you, Elaine, always ask me, what does Elaine believe? <laughs> That's a question yeah. I what ask myself. What does Elaine believe? <laughs> and do you, be, do you believe, this is maybe an unfair question, but do you believe in God? And how do you think about belief? But as you know, Eric, we've had a few discussions. Um, I think belief is partly overrated. Um, you know, people think that the question about religion is, do you believe in this or that? Because Christianity in the fourth century was defined as a, as a set of beliefs. But there was a Christian movement for 300 years before that. And it was constituted of people who shared the same values, who had a certain faith, who uh, worshipped together, who prayed together. And that, to me, was deeper because there were times when I didn't feel I could believe in anything particularly. But I was sustained by the community of, of people. And so I feel that that's more important. Um, so many traditions, like Judaism, is not primarily about what you believe, or maybe some people feel it is. But it's about, do you practice? Are you orthodox? Do you, To what degree do you practice? To what degree do you... Uh, participate in holy days or or dietary laws or not mm -hmm. it's it's a matter of how you live and i really felt that that these texts are are about that and about how we deeply care about each other i mean the center of the christian message which of course comes from its jewish sources is about relationship between people and how we treat each other that's the that's the fundamental theme of these sources. Mm -hmm. So that to me is the most important, uh, the way we connect with each other. You're teaching a course this semester on God and Buddha. No, no, Jesus and Jesus Buddha. And Buddha. <laughs> Not God and Buddha. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Jesus and Buddha. Tell us a bit about the course. You're well, co-teaching it, right? It's really fun. Okay. I couldn't teach it myself because okay. none of us knows enough, uh, nobody I know, to teach about Christianity and Buddhism. I mean, when I was a graduate student, there was a wonderful teacher about Buddhism, but I realized I couldn't take his course because, I mean, I couldn't follow it really because I didn't know the languages and I was struggling with the languages I had to learn for the Christian sources and the Jewish ones. Um, but I'm teaching with a colleague. He doesn't know much about Christianity, and I don't know much about Buddha, but we decided to teach each other. So we're teaching a course together. We have hundreds of students, and we talk about, you know, the birth stories of the Buddha, the birth stories of Jesus, the teachings of the Buddha, the teachings of Jesus, what's similar, what's different. And it's just been, 
enormous fun. I mean, we're learning a lot from each other. And um, I hope the students are, too. <laughs> I'm sure they are. I'd like to open the floor up for questions. I'm sure there are some questions here. Or comments. Or comments. <laughs> My wife turned me on to your work, and uh, we have this tonight. Haven't read it yet, read the reviews. Uh, I got my faith from my father. I'm not particularly doctrinaire, but I find that my faith in some form of afterlife permits me to not worry so much about reaching <laughs> that transition. Uh, I'm curious, and, and I, so the question you just answered, you know, what your own faith looks like, importance of friendship, but do you have any uh, aspects of the afterlife belief that might make it easier to not worry about the transition? <laughs> well, I hope so. I mean, I don't mean I don't care about belief. It's just that it's often seen as the only issue. Um, you know, before I was I was brought up to think that when people die, um, it's like what Steve Jobs said: it "Lights out." You know, that's that's the that's annihilation. And my experience of those losses of those deaths uh, challenged that because other things happened. And one thing I decided about this book was that I would write about experiences that people usually keep quiet. Um, I was talking to a friend who's a poet, Marie Howe, about, she'd written a beautiful poem called Annunciation. It was about uh, Jesus' mother, Mary, and, and suddenly she senses a divine presence that uh, that, of overpowering love approaching her, the angel Gabriel. And she wrote this poem, Annunciation, beautiful poem. And I said, Marie, how did you write that? That's really amazing poem. She said, well, you know, it happened to me. But of course, I couldn't say that. And I said, why not? And she said, that's the last taboo. And I thought, oh, okay, I'm going to write about that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, having an experience you can't explain. I've, there are some, and I know there are people here who've had them. But many people don't talk about them. And I thought, hey, I can't explain them. But all I can say is they happened. So I have now a sense of hope that maybe I will see those beloved people again. Because... I just had different experiences about that. And I'd love to hear about other people's too. Another thing people don't talk about very often is the death of a child. I mean, of anything people talk about, you know, they can talk about their sex lives ad infinitum. But if you've had that experience, many people will never say it unless they know that you had that experience. And if I hadn't, I'd probably say, if somebody said this to me, I would say, oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. Back off. But now I, if somebody says that, I say, oh, what happened? You know, because this is another, another kind of experience that is better shared than endured in solitude, as it too often is. So I felt that if I wrote about it, it might open up some of those conversations for other people as well. One of the formative books of my religious thinking was C.H. Dodd's book, The Fourth Gospel, and the idea that the Gnostic teachings of Hermes Trimagistus and the idea of the Logos made its way into standard Christian theology. And I'm wondering if that idea, that the, the, uh, the ideas that worked their way from Gnosticism into Orthodox Christianity forms part of your studies. That's an interesting question. I mean, he wrote that before these texts were found. Mm -hmm. And so I guess I haven't thought of them that way for quite a while. I did read Dodds, of course. Mm -hmm. he's, a, he's a very powerful exponent of the fourth gospel. Um, I was thinking of Karen Armstrong's book she did on the 12 uh, steps for uh, compassionate, uh, you know, the charter that and, and Charter of Compassion. Charter of Compassion. And that whole thing brought me to the, the thought about the work that you've done that's sort of seminal, starting with the Gnostic Gospels. Um, and I wonder if your assessment of this knowledge that has now come 
to the fore of people's attention over the last 30 years, I guess. Yeah. Um, what, what's your take on the change? Has this affected um, the way people look at religion, the Gospels in particular? Um, you know, what's your overall assessment? You're in that world pretty close. Yeah, well, it depends. I think a lot of people who are familiar with this work have said to me that that they can they can like Christianity more than they did <laughs> if if they see this wider spectrum they they can engage it more and understand uh, how to sort of have perspective on these traditions um, scholars are divided most of the ones I know really now say well this is part of the story we have to include now we understand that there's a much wider spectrum out there and there are some for example at Cambridge University Department of Theology in England who say well yes but this is rubbish in the first century it's still rubbish <laughs> and and they're spending a lot of time trying to disprove it the man who says that has written a massive book on the Gospel of Thomas showing how derivative and unimportant it is um, but I want to say I'm not just an un unequivocal advocate for religions, you know, because often they damage people, they harm people. Um, Christian anti-Semitism is one obvious example, but other ways that these traditions have demeaned people whose experience is different, whose sexuality is different, who belong to different cultures. Um, I mean, I think, you know, there's damage that's done by these religious traditions. And I talk about that too. I think it's very important to know where we're being shaped by cultural influences that we might need to say no to. And, and so that's part of the work. Um, yeah, and, and that's what Karen talks about in her book, um, pretty much parallels what you're saying. Yeah. Well, she gave it up completely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the yeah, Catholic Church, but it didn't do that to you. No, it didn't, because yeah. I still, I still really love some elements of this tradition very much. You love liturgy and language and poetry and music. Yeah. Yes, yeah. the music. I mean, that's that's really the the most direct route. <laughs> There's a familiar trope that we hear in our society. Uh, how can there be a God that I can't believe in a God that there is no God if God allows suffering, such as the Nazi Holocaust, nuclear Holocaust, the death of a child. And in academic circles, someone like Bart Ehrman's belief became unbelief after his theological inquiries, which all seems to run counter to this enduring presence of religion in society. Are these two forces doing some kind of battle with each other? Belief versus unbelief? What's your assessment? I don't know. Bart Ehrman is, is a, uh, you know, he, he's a writer. He teaches at the University of North Carolina. He was, he was a very devout evangelical Christian until he recognized how much killing there is in the world. And then he said he couldn't believe in God. I don't think God has to do with that killing. Um, he said to me, how can you possibly still have any faith? And I said, Bart, I don't know what you're talking about. I just don't understand how he thinks about that. I mean, you know, suffering and death are, are natural. I mean, I see them as part of the way we live. There are parts of Christian tradition that, that can be improved, I think. And some of these texts, well, let, now let me just say, I'm not, I'm not trying to make it up. <laughs> it's just that if you read, say, the Gospel of Truth, there's a different version of the story of Jesus. Not that he came into the world because God would not, a, a loving God would not forgive your sins unless an innocent man were tortured and killed. But that Jesus came into the world to show us who we are, to show us that we belong to each other and to this source from which we come. And the, the price for coming into the world, his, yours, mine, is that we suffer and die. That's just the kind of creatures we are. But it's not a punishment. Uh, that's a different reading of the crucifixion story. And it, it's a beautiful text. It's, it's a poetic text. And it says, and so he discovered us in himself and we discovered him in ourselves. 
um, and led us back into the Father, into the Mother. The Mother is the Holy Spirit here, a feminine, in, in, of course, in Hebrew and Syriac. And Jesus of the infinite sweetness. It's a very beautiful text. Thank you. <laughs> My question, question over here. Hi. My question may dovetail a bit with his. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, and this is much more in a personal nature. I've, I haven't read your book. I am very much look forward to it. Um, I am a practicing Catholic um, who's, having, who's having a lot of questions right now. But that's what I'm here for mostly tonight. And, and I'm really excited to hear your discussion, is that I, too, have had a lot of personal suffering with children. They are still alive, but they've lost interest at times in living mm -hmm. and um, have had That's really hard. significant issues. And they're currently 15 and 20 and, and, you know, have lost a lot of faith. I said, you don't have to, you know, we, we try to motivate without pushing things, but I want them still to feel like to have some purpose. But a question, a specific question I want to ask you is, um, my closest friend's husband died less than two months ago, six weeks after being misdiagnosed. And I was going out for a girl's weekend to Colorado and ended up being out there when he was, um, had a heart attack during his chemotherapy and passed away. So I have spent a lot of time with her and she's a practicing Catholic. And she's saying she's very angry. And, um, you know, I've had a lot of death, too. I understand that anger. What she is asking me and what the statements is, she says, I don't know if I have any faith. I don't know if I have any beliefs anymore. And this is a specific question. Why is it? We always thought we lived a good life. We tried to do the right thing. We tried to be good to others. We tried to live a good life, helping, volunteering, being good community people. And yet, Lee died in six weeks. And I'm really angry, and I don't know what to do anymore. I don't know what to do with that. And I, I like your the essence of how sometimes you just have to suffer and be angry. But I also feel like we talk all the time. I wonder if there's any nuggets, anything that you could give me, simply to help her kind of think through this. Two things. I mean, that's a lot you've said. Uh, and it's really hard to deal with. I mean, I totally understand her saying she's, you know, down in the in the ocean and there's just nothing there. I mean, I've been there. Um, and being angry, I think, is very important. I mean, I realized that I was brought up in this sort of, you know, middle class California sort of secular world. There were no ways to deal with death. Um, and I had to learn how. And And one of the things that... I learned from an anthropologist, Rosalda Rosario, um, is that the culture I was brought up in did not deal with anger around death like that. Uh, Rosalda was a, he, he teaches at NYU, he's an anthropologist, worked in the Philippines with, with headhunters, headhunting tribes. And the headhunting is something men would practice in that tribe. Uh, when somebody died violently or something went wrong, they would make a vow that they would, a sacred vow that they would go out and kill the first person they meet, cut off the head and throw it away, and that would carry their anger. And he thought this was really weird. <laughs> Until his wife fell from a cliff and died and he found her body. And he said the feelings that went through him, I mean, even telling you this, reading what he wrote, I understand how he felt. And he said, then he was angry, and he said, well, you know, Christians and Jews don't, anger is not acknowledged as a part of that experience, and it's very important. I mean, I found the book of Job, something I read a lot. Job was really angry, mm -hmm. as if he deserved certain things and didn't right. get them. But when you speak of the Catholic Church, see, I, I can't just throw away all these traditions because... Uh, I got to know some Trappist monks in Colorado in a small, beautiful, very simple monastery up in the mountains. And when these things happened, um, one of them taught me how to meditate, Thomas Keating, mm -hmm. an extraordinary man with a very deep spiritual presence. And that probably kept me alive. And those monks had a deep silence. They didn't talk much. But when they did, they spoke with great compassion and depth. 
And I've often been to that monastery. I, go, I still go. They know I'm a heretic and a <coughs> Protestant, but they're okay with that. And, um, and I find somehow I need that. That monastery has felt like a deep well of silence sometimes. And I've discovered some mysteries in that silence that I didn't expect. I think that's, so I that's think helpful. I think it helps not to give up. I think so. I also think it's important that um, you kind of divorce the way of thinking. If I live a good, if I live a good life, I you know I keep telling that her, doesn't Go. work, right? You know I live a good life, so I'm good things happen to good people, right? Uh, no, it's a book of Job. <laughs> that's yeah. you know that that illusion that we're somehow protected. I thought after our son died, well, okay, the worst thing has happened. Can you imagine anything worse? I can't. Well, I do. I mean, violence is worse than what I dealt with. Mm -hmm. And I'm grateful I never had to deal with the death of someone I love to violence. That's worse. But it was it was terrible. And um, oh, what was I saying? I, I lost it. But Elaine, there was guilt. You felt the, guilt. Well, I felt guilt because, you know, whenever there's something wrong with a child, you talk about your sons or, or children you know, you're not being sure they want to live. A mother feels guilty because that's how mothers are. I, I felt guilty that my son had this weird illness, which is very rare. Nobody knows why it happens. It's very rare illness. It just happened, you know. And, um, and then I realized at one point that, that guilt was masking something even harder to bear. And the thing that was harder to bear than guilt was helplessness. Mm -hmm. There was nothing I could do to help that child survive. Mm -hmm. And that just tore me apart. So I'd rather feel guilty than helpless. That's what I realized. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And we punish ourselves that way. And people punish you like, well, your child, well, you must have done something wrong. You must have been defective as a mother, right? Mm -hmm. No, I mean, you're helpless sometimes, things that happen. And I think that is very grounding. But it's we have so little agency in what happens. That's really hard to take. But I think it's true. Thank you. What about a person who has experienced childhood abuse by a priest or some other life-defining personal trauma that stems from religious hypocrisy? Wouldn't it be only rational for that person to reject religion and conclude, I'm entirely on my own in navigating my days on earth? Yes, I think so. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, I think that person would do very well to walk out of that church and not go back. I did that at one point. Had to, you know, when they told me that thing about my friend. But to navigate life completely alone is, is not a very, it's not a very nurturing way to do it. I mean, one would have to find other forms of nurture with other people, I think. What I meant was without the spiritual nurture of a church. A lot of people do. I don't think, see, when I say I'm not a, just an advocate for religion because it harms people sometimes, then People that I know, my husband loved nature. He was loved to be out in nature. That was his passion, his delight, his spirituality, whatever it was, was the beauty of the world. Um, I have friends who, who deeply love music, poetry, dance, some who, who find their meaning and passion in life by caring for people whether they're volunteers, whether they're physicians, they take care of people and they know that that matters. So I don't think it has to be religion that one would find. I think in, if I were in that circumstance, I could easily imagine finding a very different direction to connect with people and find <laughs> meaning. Thank you. But thank you. Thank you so much, even for your spiritual presence. 
uh, it's just remarkable. Talk a little bit more about the gospel of truth. Is that something that we find someplace? I thought I was familiar with most of the gospels, but not that one. But I do want to say to you, um, I had the occasion of meeting Billy Graham and invited him to a local nursing home here. And he did come because it was the eldest that really watched him and knew him so well. And while he did his crusade in the stadium, it was these people that looked so forward, you know, to seeing him. Now, that's not philosophy. That's just the facts of life. And he did walk around and greet people and touch them. And it meant everything to them. Uh, are you familiar with the name Candace Pert at all? I'm done. No. Okay. Well, Candace Pert was a physician and was at NIH. And I have had some of those experiences that you talk about. And I am a woman of color, and I know many other people who've had them as well. And I had a discussion with her about that. And she said to me that they knew at NIH that there was another realm and a very spiritual realm. And she said they dared not talk about it, speaking of the unknown and things you don't talk about. And she said because they would lose their funding, they would be accused of dealing in the occult. But she validated every experience that I had and what I knew to be so. So I just want to support you uh, in that, because here stands one, I know what I know, and I have been there. Yes, I, I think that's it's true for so many people. I, I love the book of William James. I don't know if you know this, Varieties of Religious Experience. He's a psychologist writing in, in 1912 against Freud, who basically says religion is an illusion, for mm -hmm. so grow up and live mm -hmm. without it, right? Mm -hmm. It's for little children. And... And uh, William James went into a deep depression. And he says he came out of it by clinging to sayings like, the Lord is my refuge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He said, I didn't believe them at the time, but I just grabbed onto them like logs, you know, of a drowning man in, in, in the water. And he said, and it, it took him back. It brought him back to life. So he knew that Religious experience is powerful. It's real. It can heal people. Uh, the The founding of Alcoholics Anonymous came out of that book, and all the other twelve step programs were written out of his book. And the first chapter is called "The Reality of the Unseen," mm -hmm. and he reports many uh, anecdotes of that kind. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you. You have a question here? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, I have a question about, can you, uh, can, you can you highlight or can you explain the origin of the concept of God and Satan? And are they the, uh, <laughs> the and are they the, the flip, are, are they like based in dualism? I don't think so. Not always. Are they based in dualism? I don't know. I mean, the origin of the of ideas about God is so far back in human history that it's prehistoric, I think. Um, no, the origin of Satan I, I've written about, and that those stories come up about the time of Jesus, about 2,000 years ago, in Jewish and Christian tradition. And I did write about how they come about and, and what, they, uh, what they articulate, and I think they have a, a, a lot of power in this culture, because I realize they have to do with the origin of Christian anti-Semitism. So, and I wasn't looking for that at all. So when you were doing your research on Satan, did you come across the concept of Sohak? No. Okay. I don't know what Sohak is. It's an ancient uh, concept in Iran of Ah, Satan. well, of course, Zoroastrian tradition yeah. has, you know, that dualistic sense. But this, this was before that time, okay. I think, of Zoroastrian. That could well be influential, of course. These traditions really mix a lot. Thank you. Thank you. One more question? Yes? Well, you. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I do have one question, and, and it's coming. Yes, okay. So my question is coming from a place that's very alive at the moment with the recent passing of my daughter, uh, who went at about the same age, it seems, um, as your son. And you're speaking about how in all of this you've come to... You know, basically seeing how little say and authority we have in what happens. And I'm just wondering, as you're coming to terms with this, 
not the passing, but this thing that we have so little say, how do you prevent yourself from going into the state of, you know, kind of victim of God? Because I can't imagine God acting that way, <laughs> making people into victims. I mean, that's just not a way I can, my mind works. But feeling like a victim, yeah, I guess we, we, we do sometimes. What were you thinking further? Well, that, that was that, because it's, it's so easy to go from this, well, you know, it, there was absolutely nothing I could have done to save my daughter. It was a kind of medical condition where doctors would say, they, we, we just can't neither treat it nor cure it, just nothing. Right. So I wanted to say, well, you know, how God could have possibly done this to me and to her? See, I don't think that God does those things. When, when, I'll never forget when policemen came to the door in Colorado and I had my two-year-old and my three-month-old baby, one-and-a-half-year-old and three-month-old baby, and I was making lasagna for dinner because my husband was out hiking. Policemen came to the door to tell me that he had died. And the policeman said, God never gives us more than we can handle. And I looked at him and I thought, how do you know what I can handle? Do you know that our son died a year ago? And do you, is, do you think this is a gift from God? No. Are you out of your mind? I didn't say a word. I could not speak. Um, I did rip the door off its handles <laughs> because it was so upsetting that he would say such a thing as if this was something God did. I don't believe that. I see when we talk about some of these traditions at their best, they're sources of consolation. My question was, how do you not go into despair? Right, and just give that, up. That's the next in line. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's the option. I saw that happen to my husband's mother. She was so devastated by his, his death um, that she just went straight into despair and and sank and died. I mean, she'd given up religion. She had no way at all to cope with it. I'm not saying that's the only way. There are lots of others. And I didn't want to go that way, especially for the children, too. So the question, how do you not go into despair? How do, you, how do we find hope? How do we regenerate? That's, that's what I really care about. And I think what's amazing to me is that we can survive things we think we can't survive. That's amazing. And I'm very grateful for it. Thank you very Elaine, much. Thank you for what you said. You have such a beautiful mind and such a wonderful heart and such a wonderful way of teaching and informing and creating understanding. You're a wonderful writer, a poetic writer. And one of the things that I most admire about you is the humility that you bring to your quest for truth. And it comes through the pages of every book you write. I'll give you the last words. You end your book with a beautiful Jewish prayer. Blessed art thou, Lord God of the universe, that you have brought us alive to see this day. What does that mean to you? I think it's, it, you know, like the person who just spoke, uh, there are times when I felt I could never survive what happened or didn't want to, uh, even though I know many people have survived much worse. And the fact that we did, you know, um, just seems like a, a gift and a miracle. And I just, I'm, I'm very grateful for that. I just think the capacity, you know, for resilience is much greater than I could have imagined. And I see this in many other people who have dealt with much more. And I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>